Hello, and welcome to tonight's Travel Talk, Holiday Markets with Julia Lambert. The OSU Alumni Association's Travel Talk series is our way of connecting the experts of OSU in the places we go with our group travel program. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you are, if there are any alumni um, out there in the audience tonight that have been on one of our tours, say hello in chat. The chat box is open. You're welcome to say hi to each other and let folks know where you've been. It's always nice to see some of those travel veterans out there. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, the OSU Alumni Association Group Travel Program has been around for over 30 years, connecting Oregon Staters with one and over other all over the world through travel experiences. This um, um, brings OSU expert faculty in all areas of the university right to your home, and sometimes they even go on tour with us. Each month we have programs on topics related to where you wanna go in the travel industry. And so you'll wanna check out the schedule. Uh, this winter, or sorry, this uh, spring, we've got some great programs coming up. In May, we have one called Connections Across the Pond. It's a geology conversation on the similarities of landscapes of Europe and North America. And then another one on sustainable seafood choices at home and while away. In June, there'll be uh, a talk on the collapse of the Bronze Age and the birth of the Greek gods. So you'll wanna check those off out. We will take July and August off, much like our students do, and we get back in the fall with some more wonderful conversations. We also have a library of great recorded talks that you can watch at any time. And you can see those at fororegonstate.org slash travel talk. For anyone that is living in Corvallis or by Corvallis, um, I really want you to know about this really great program that's happening on campus on April 18th. We have a special alumni night uh, for this movie. It's called The Wonder and the Worry. It's an OSU documentary film that traces the fragmentation and upheaval in photojournalism and its impact on the world's most iconic publication, the National Geographic magazine. The film is about the disruption and the power of environmental storytelling as it follows the intertwined careers of Chris Johns, who is an OSU alumnus and former National Geographic editor, and his daughter, Louise, and she is a freelance photographer. You may recall Chris from his Travel Talks presentation on Yellowstone, and he did that with Oregon State Ecology Professor Bill Ripple. Later, he led our Winter in Yellowstone tour, and believe it or not, they saw 20 wolves on the first day on that trip. It was pretty great. So I'm going to post here in chat um, the recording of that travel talk if you ever want to watch it. Um, they're also online as well. And um, also, Chris was an alumni fellow. He received that designation in 2020, and he did really a jaw-dropping presentation on what it's like to be a photojournalism a photojournalist, and I'm going to post that in chat as well if you ever want to check those out. Richard, I see that your hand is raised, so if you do have a question, feel free to pop it in chat and we'll, we'll address it that way because all of our audience microphones are turned off at this time, but you can always reach us or anybody can reach us with the chat box or by um, putting in a question in the Q&A box, either one. So go ahead and type your question in and um, I'll talk, we'll answer your question for you. Um, one other couple, two other announcements before we go ahead with the talk tonight. Damn Proud Day is coming up on April 24th. Uh, you may know about Damn Proud Day. It's OSU's largest single day of giving. You will see emails in your email box about Damn Proud Day. You will see posts on all the social media sites about Damn Proud Day. It is us getting folks excited to support OSU students with scholarships um, to support research that is helping with today's most pressing problems, continue education programs like this one and other outreach efforts with the university. So on April 24th, you'll wanna go to damnprouddayorg um, and there you can watch a live broadcast through the day. You'll hear from coaches, you'll hear from OSU leadership, you'll hear from students, you'll hear from a lot of folks um, about Oregon State. So put it on your calendar, um, April 24th, damnprouddayorg That's where you'll view the live streaming broadcast during the day. 
And then in May, it's OSU days of service. We've changed it to the full month of May. So it's our time where Oregon Staters give back to their local communities and volunteer at places that mean the most to them. So if you love to volunteer in your community, you'll, you're will welcome to do that. Log your hours at um, fouroregonstate.org, or sorry, for Oregon State. Oh, it should say .org, not edu. I'll have to fix that on my slide. Sorry about that. Slash service. And um, that's where you'll learn about OSU days of service. And that is the whole month of May. Okay, enough of all of my announcements. Um, we are going to move on and talk about tonight's travel talk with Julie. Julie Lambert is the president and founder of Lambert Group Corporate Solutions, a consulting firm that aids businesses in overcoming barriers to continue growth via strategic planning, process design, and compliance analysis. Previously, she spent over 25 years as director in finance and human resources, um, first leading uh, for a leading beverage manufacturer, then for an independent K through 12 school. Other roles include working in finance and in development, including a stint at the OSU Foundation's first telefun coordinator. Julia is currently serves in the National Panhellenic Delegation for Alpha Psi Data Fraternity and has volunteered with the organization since 1990. She is a member of the OSU Alumni Association's board um, of directors since 2015, and she is our current board chair. And previously, she was a member of the Alumni Association's Advisory Council. She received her bachelor's in business administration at OSU in 85 and her MBA from Golden Gate University in 92. In 2017, Julie did travel on a similar holiday markets tour, um, similar to the one that we have this fall. And she's here tonight to tell us all about her trip. Welcome, Julie. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, Kate. Happy to be here. This is going to make me want to sign up, but I think I've already got too many things going on in December. <laughs> yes, and you're going on our Croatia tour, so you already have a trip booked. <laughs> I do. Yay! <laughs> well, great. Well, we're going to let Julie take it away. I'm going to have my camera off, but if anybody has questions, please do type that into chat or Q&A. And um, we will answer your questions. At times, I might just interrupt Julie and, and pop in and let her know that she's got a question, or we'll do them at the end, depending on where we are in the program. But um, so feel free to stay interactive while she talks. Take it away, Julie. Great. Thank you, Kate. So the Holiday Markets River Cruise, this is just kind of a quick overview that uh, photo on the left is in a storefront, and I think that might have been Budapest, actually, but that company, Kath Wolfhart, is well known throughout Europe for all of their great Christmas items. You'll see that the cities will decorate even at night, so you have these fabulous light installations. And then this is my Alpha Z Delta sister, sorority sister, that I went on the cruise with. Um, it was really cold. You will see all of our photos. We are totally bundled up. <laughs> For those of you who haven't been on a travel program through the Alumni Association, you know, I this trip coming up in September will be my fourth. They've got so many great options. You get to meet not only other beavers, but members and alums and their friends from other universities who might be on the same trip. And the thing I really appreciate is that traveling with university-led tours, you get like-minded travelers, people who are really curious and adventurous. So let's see what we have. This is actually a picture of the symphony, which is the boat that will be used on your tour. I've been on a few riverboat cruises, both with OSU and um, through Viking. And it's so nice to be docked city center. It's a much more casual atmosphere than a larger ship. Um, I found the rooms to always be nice and spacious. And of course, that lovely benefit of just unpacking once. Now, I'd mentioned earlier how cold it was. Um, bring lots of layers, gloves, hats. 
Um, somebody gave me the tip to bring two good pairs of insulated shoes or boots because sometimes you'll have a wet, soggy pair from one day and they need an extra day to dry out. So um, that really saved me a couple of times on this trip. I also like tossing in a few Ziplocs and then I will line the inside of my suitcase with bubble wrap. Sometimes it's hard to find bubble wrap or the vendors that you're purchasing things from may not have it. So, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't weigh anything, doesn't take up much room. And if you don't need it at the end, you can just leave it behind. Now, Kate's going to pop a um, article from the Smithsonian in the chat on the um, history of Christmas markets. So while I know that there are other things to do on these holiday market uh, trips, going to the Christmas markets is a big part of it. Originally, as you can see, it was for people to gather before the winter solstice. And it's interesting to know that some markets will start as early as mid-November and go all the way to Epiphany, but depending on your rule, the region that you're traveling to and sometimes the country, times will be a little bit different on when they're open. Um, there were also some that didn't open to like four o'clock on some of the trips I've been on. So kind of odd, but it's an interesting article. Smithsonian always does a great job. My tips for going into the market are to look for those local vendors. In my first slide, I showed you a major retailer. You will see booths from that vendor or that company, as well as some other ones in many of the markets that you go to, no matter the city or the country. Think of it like your county fair, where you've got the same person doing you know, stuffed hot dogs or cotton candy will travel around to the fairs. Um, in Europe, there are a few large players that are at many of the holiday markets. I found the most unique items that I collected on my trip were from those local vendors, the artisans. They may not have the primo location in the market square, but be sure to search them out. And then some of the local stores will also have great specials. You know, feel free to pop into any city that's on the, or any shop that's on the square and see what they have offered. The other big uh, fun part of the Christmas markets were the food and drink offerings. So I found a fun article on what to eat at a holiday market that Kate will stick in the chat. The street food runs from, you know, great French fries or spiced warm nuts. Um, the glue vine is a spiced drink, usually with wine. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of rum and um, other spices like star anise and some cinnamon. And when it's cold, you know, in the 30s, as it can be during some of those daytime adventures that you'll be on, you will want that nice mug of a, you know, adult beverage. They also have non-alcoholic versions to keep you warm while you're doing your shopping. Another souvenir that you can collect while you are at these um, Christmas markets are actually the Glühwein mugs. Usually when you purchase your Glühwein, it's maybe four or five euros, plus you put on a deposit of two or three euros for the mug. So as you're walking around the market, you can stay warm, you can enjoy your beverage, and then it the time that you finished or you're ready to leave the market you can either keep the mug or if you don't like it, you can take it back to the stand where you got your glue vine and they'll give you your mug deposit back. So another good reason for the bubble wrap is to be able to wrap your 
Glühwein mugs in that on your trip. Now, I had mentioned earlier that it's not all about the Christmas markets. They're, you know, being on the Rhine, it's such a rich area for history in Europe and Germany and France. And most of these cities that you'll be visiting have amazing castles, there's fun museums. You can, in addition to your AHI guide or the local guide who will take you on a walking tour, you can also in your free time, maybe hire a guide to take you somewhere else in town, depending on how much time you have. Uh, the photo on the far left, yes, that is snow covering the outdoor dining areas uh, from this little cafe I visited um, and the snow covered blankets that they give you to wrap around yourself, but they come and clear those off. Um, there's horse-drawn carriages. Um, if you are a fan of art and how um, the EU and the US have been working together to kind of maybe repatriate some of the artworks that were um, absconded with during World War II. If you haven't already watched Monuments Men, which is a great movie from about 10 years ago, I would suggest watching that. Um, gives a great accounting of how, even though we were obviously working with the Allies to win the war, we had an appreciation for the art and the history that was throughout Germany and tried to avoid some of the bombing um, because of that. So your itinerary is a little bit different than the tour I went on. There are a few cities in common, but I just thought I'd run through a quick um, mock-up or a quick list of what you will be seeing. So you'll start um, in Dusseldorf, day one is your travel day and spend a few days in Dusseldorf, which has an amazing um, Christmas market, beautiful city center. Cologne is a city that I did visit. That's where we started the cruise that I went on a few years ago. The cathedral there in Cologne in particular is interesting to go through. That um, cathedral was heavily bombed during the war, but because it takes so many hundreds of years to build those massive cathedrals, a portion of it had a wooden roof and a portion had a part slate, part metal roof. And the wooden portion obviously burned, but a lot of the artifacts in that cathedral were saved because of the later construction. So it's always interesting to hear the local guides tell you about their city um, treasures like the Cologne Cathedral. This is a picture of that cathedral and that whole empty area there will be filled with vendor booths and food booths and arts and crafts for children to participate in. And I think that's a teeny tiny person there kind of right underneath that main spire. So it gives you an idea of the scale <laughs> and how massive their market is. After Cologne, you'll go through the Rhine Gorge which is a beautiful stretch of river. When I traveled, it was a clear but very cold day and the uh, kitchen crew and bar staff had some snacks and some glue vine for us and we all sat up top on the upper deck of the boat um, and there were they narrated the history of the different cities that we were passing as we were going down the gorge. Um, so it might be a good time to take a nap if you want to do that, but also do take advantage of some of the lectures that will be available on your cruising portions. 
of your journey. Now, Kate and I are not quite sure on the Mannheim Heidelberg section. Um, it looks like you dock in Mannheim and then go to, into Heidelberg, um, but you might have some time in Mannheim as well. Um, I have been to Heidelberg. It's I had some. It was not on my tour, but I had some friends who were living there. And we went to visit before we got on the, the cruise. And they have the most amazing schloss, which is the word for castle. <coughs> Next, Kate. So the schloss sits high up on the hill overlooking the river. And some of the fun things there on the left is the apothecary museum that's located inside the castle. Then there's that huge wine barrel. If there was a notation of how many gallons it held, but I think in versions of cases of wine, over 14,400 cases of wine came out, could come out of that barrel. It's huge and there, you can see the staircase, you can walk up and over it. And then of course, all the pastries, every city you go to, all of the markets will have these fabulous, flaky, buttery, chocolatey, caramely nuts. Oh, everything is just amazing. And the gingerbread too. So be sure when you're in Heidelberg to take some time to go up and down the main street. I think it's Hauptstrasse, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's a darling little street with a bunch of shops and restaurants all up and down. After that stop, you get a quick foray into France, into Strasbourg. Strasbourg has flipped back and forth between German and French governance for, you know, centuries. It's a very unique city. There's even a building there that is very Egyptian in its architecture and decor. I'm not quite sure of why or how, but it is, I saw it when I clicked on that visit Strasbourg link. Freilberg and Breisach will be your last main city that you will be in. And they also have the beautiful old town with the half timbered buildings and goes all the way back to the 13th century. Now, the tour itself, if you're not doing the extension, will end the next day in Basel. But if you're planning to go on this trip and maybe you haven't made your flight arrangements yet, I would certainly urge you to look at maybe other cities or other Christmas markets to attend. I have been to Europe three times during December over the last decade or so. And when Kate flips to the next slide, you'll see a few photos of other markets. The one in the middle is a little hard to tell, but those streaks that might you might think are light is actually a pounding snowstorm. <laughs> uh, but being able to be in the markets in the evening, which I think you only have a chance to do in one or two of your port cities, is really something special. Of course, remember that it will get light later and dark earlier, given the time of year and the latitude that you will be on your trip. So I, again, the next slide, we took a, uh, a detour one year and went to Luxembourg, which, you know, I've kind of got the, hankering to uh, check off a bunch of different cities and countries on my to-do list. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yes, and as Kate mentions, it's always great to do your Christmas shopping there and see all the lights. And then I also did a trip on my own where I went, I can't recall where that middle um, picture was taken. It might have been Nuremberg, but might have also been Prague. And we did Budapest, Prague, and Vienna. And boy, traveling around um, that part of the world in December is just so magical. Now, if you are going to be a shopper, you might think, how am I gonna get everything home? Um, Kate's gonna put a couple of links in the chat. One is all about the VAT, which is the value added tax that is um, assessed in Europe. If you, and I've seen a couple of different um, levels, dollar amounts, minimums for you to be able to try to collect that. Usually it's around 100, might have gone up to 150 euros per vendor that would be eligible then for you to be able to recoup that bat. Now, at times when I've done this, it's been easy and nobody has been in line at the airport, um, which is where you have to do the VAT refunds. Um, a couple of times there have been 30 people in line and it's like, you know, it's not worth the 20 euros I might get back for that. Another good resource is the U.S. Customs website and the Know Before You Go is a great resource with some FAQs on your personal exemption. So you can bring back the equivalent of $800 per person when you return to the States. And, um, oh, the other thing, if you do ship things home, it will not count against your personal exemption. So um, if you find yourself maybe finding some fabulous treasures that might bump you over that amount, it could benefit you to actually ship things home. So that was a whole lot of information in a short amount of time. <laughs> no, this is great. So when you were on the tour, what would you say would be was one of your most favorite aspects of the of traveling during the holidays? What did you really like the best? You know, it when I went, it was a little bit earlier in the year than when you are traveling on this tour this year. Um, so it definitely got me in the, the holiday mood. And I am a big art history buff. Being able to see so many of the cathedrals and museums, um, and especially at Christmas when a lot of them are decorated for the holidays, was just very magical. Yeah. And that's a really good point too, because you when people are traveling together, if you're traveling with, you know, a partner or a friend or someone, there might be one person that's more into shopping than the other person. That's not so much. And there's still so much that you can do on the tour. That's not shopping all the different sites to see, and there's guided walks and there's visits to museums. So there's a lot that can fill your day besides shopping. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And usually we would arrive in a city and then have um, our, well, first of all, AHI, who's the tour organizer, is fabulous. I've been on three other AHI trips and they are really good at details. They hire the best local guides and they always make sure the group stays together. <laughs> um, so you should have no worries about that. Um, but then, you know, your AHI guide will come off the ship with you, connect you with your local tour guide. It's my experience. It was maybe an hour and a half. I think at the most two hours that you would have a walking tour around the major sites of a city. And then you would either be escorted back to the boat if it was time for lunch or if you didn't want to eat lunch on ship 
you could go out and explore and just make sure to be back well before sailing time. Yes. Good tip. <laughs> That's big thing when you're traveling um, is make sure you know when to get back to the yeah. ship. <laughs> Another thing about the tours is that you will have a um, little audio vox machine with an earpiece, or you could bring your own earpiece that you will take with you on the tours. So you don't have to say, uh, stay all clustered together in a little huddle as you're a tour guide is explaining things to you. They have um, quite a range on the receivers from the main mic that your tour guide will use. So um, it's nice to be able to maybe wander over and take a picture of a detail, you know, on a, I don't know, we did this one graveyard tour that was very cool. <laughs> Took pictures of some really beautiful carvings on that while the group was, 50 feet away in the opposite direction. Another yeah. good tip is if you can't hear your tour guide, then you need to put your head up and look around and see which direction they went to, because that means you're out <laughs> of range. <laughs> yeah, that's the tricky thing that the earpieces are really great for travel because you can hear and listen and watch and see, but you do always have to keep that eye on the guide because it's easy to look the other way and then have them turn a corner. So Yes, definitely. And that's why you always put only one earpiece in your ear so you can still hear what is around you. That's definitely true. Um, and I did want to show you all on the, this is the actual uh, co-branded website for this tour. And if you want to do a more of a deep dive on the itinerary, there's right here, it says full view the full itinerary and that will take take you through um, what you do each day and um, you'll see that when if it has indications on what meals are provided that day and then there's usually a choice um, and this is pretty small type usually a choice of an excursion uh, that you can do during the day and then I'll allow uh, let you know about the different free time um, we have another question that came up here. Uh, is there a single supplement? No, this is huge, especially for our solo travelers. Where yes. it is single supplement waived. When Michelle and oh, my friend and I went on the tour, we each had our own cabin and we chose cabins on the opposite side of the riverboat. So as we were going down, if there was something cool out of her window, when we weren't in an activity or at a meal, you know, she'd come knock on my door, come look at this. And I would do the same. So that was very fun. That is great. And then uh, we have another question about a more casual atmosphere on the river cruise. And are there any events or dinners that were dressier or is it casual, fine throughout? And go ahead. You know, I would say... Um, by casual, I'm not saying, you know, faded jeans, but, um, most folks during the day did just have on khakis or, you know, nicer jeans with the weather. There's so many layers that everyone has on. Um, there was definitely a lot of beaver sports gear that was worn. I think I might've even taken this with me, um, for dinners, Usually folks would put on maybe a nicer sweater, but definitely it was rare to see a woman in a dress and rare to see a man in a tie. So it was maybe smart casual. I'm trying to think of what a good, you know, definition would be for that. Maybe the yeah. colored shirt would come out at dinner instead of a sports bar. Yes, I think that's a great way to explain it. It is during the day you're in your touring clothes. That's what I call it. You're in your your comfortable touring clothes. You're in the shoes that you can walk around all day in and see things and go to museums. And, you know, there's lots of cobblestones and concrete um, over in Europe. So you do want to have those comfortable shoes uh, for being able to walk around. And then sometimes in the evenings, folks might come back to the riverboat and they may choose to change or not, or um, put on a sweater for dinner or, you know, just wear what they have on. Either way, it's you do you. <laughs> it's you're comfortable. But. And for the ladies, I found scarves were a great way to go. I have a couple of 
scarves that have maybe little sparkly threads moving through them or um, that were just a little dressier than the, the thick wool scarf that I would wear during the tour. And that can dress up a sweater pretty quickly. That and maybe, you know, change out the earrings. <laughs> yeah, I always, oh, me too. <laughs> I did want to mention that if you do buy jewelry or take nicer jewelry with you, we did have one gentleman on, I think it was when I went to Spain, had a fairly nice Rolex and the folks at customs were questioning and it was newer and were questioning him on did he really buy it in Europe or did he buy it at home and just wore it throughout? Yeah. So, um, if you do bring a more expensive piece of jewelry, um, he actually had thought about this and he had a, on his phone, he had a copy of his sales receipt that was maybe three or four years old. So we could show them and say, no, I bought it in Chicago. I did not, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to bring this back into the US. Yeah, I always tell folks just leave that stuff at home. You don't need it. Just just leave it at home. Um, good question about music and live performances. There are there is a special music performance um on this tour, and there's a tour of a a museum of mechanical musical instruments is an option. So there is a good um connection with music and musical performance on this trip as well. Um, it's, you know, in these markets too, depending on what time you're there during the day, there's typically a stage and there'll be some regional performances and music groups that'll play during the markets, much like at, you know, a, a, a fair here um, in the States, there's usually some sort of entertainment. So depending on the market and city that you're in and what time you get there, um, there'll be a variety of different things. And we did have two different musical groups that were on the um, boat with us for like evening dancing and music in the lounge area as we were cruising down the river. And that was fun to just, you know, let your hair down a little, maybe get out boogie on the dance floor a bit. Um, and they actually swapped like halfway through the cruise. So I'm yeah. guessing they're getting off one boat, getting on another one. And then yep. I see a question here from Laura. Yes, I was able to choose the cabin. There are a few, I believe on this cruise, there's a few different price points. So within mm -hmm. the range that you want, you put in your request for, you know, your top two or three cabins. Um, I found that I've always gotten the cabin or one right next to it that I preferred. I usually like being kind of mid boat but on these river cruises, it's not like being on an ocean cruise. Yeah. It's very calm. It's not choppy waters. You're not going out into the ocean or the seas at all. So um, I have been late to sign up for a cruise and had a cabin further aft and it was still fun. Yes. And on this one, I even had a traveler once and she was concerned about motion sickness and which usually on river boats, I'm very sensitive to motion sickness and I'm typically pretty okay. I still take my motion sickness medicine because I don't want to be sick, but she was concerned about it and wanted a room with a bed facing down river. So I was even able to help her get a cabin and make sure the bed is oriented going down river because she was concerned about it. So if there are some of those concerns that you have, then we can just work through that and see what cabin number that we can get you. And yes, they're in this right now, it's incredible pricing on these tours. I mean, if you want to save some money, you can um, be down on the lower level still with a good window, under $2,000 per person. So that is an incredible price point, errors additional, but um, and then, then it goes up from there. So on our screen are the three different price point points. And that is with the savings that's happening right now. And the price will go up um, after May 14. Yeah. And then we had another, uh, John commented that he has been on this tour with AHI before. And he also says that there are wonderful on-site guides. And it's always great to help you and tailor your experience to what you want to do, which is really true. Like if you're at the spot and there's a museum you really want to go to or something that you really want to see, maybe it's not on the exact itinerary, talk to the guides. 
um, see if there's a way that you can actually go to that place or see that thing. And then they'll they'll help you work through the logistics in order to do that. Or if there's you choose to do something different in your afternoon, they may actually, they'll help you um, get to where you wanna go in the afternoon as well. So um, it's a great resource to have on the tour. Um, Oh, it looks yeah. like he went on the interlock and extension too and had a great time. So that's great. Thank you for those comments. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is they have these excursions, but if you have something you really want to do, you're not required to go on the excursion. You just need to make sure to communicate that with your hosts so they're not looking for you. Thinking yep. you're in one spot in your summer. Because and some of you may you have already been to these cities. Yeah. Or what Julie said too, is you don't want to miss the ship. <laughs> so they'll tell you what time in the evening that they're docking. They try to spend the majority of your day um, at your one spot and then they'll move the ship typically in the evening hours um, or early in the morning. And I will tell you, that's actually my most favorite time on the river boats is really early in the morning or, you know, at dusk after dinner, or, you know, well, time would be different in the winter, but, um, and to get up on the top of that, top of that riverboat, and it's quiet, and it's beautiful, and I stand up there with my warm cup of coffee, and my camera, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience being on top of the boat. It's one of my most favorite things to do. There's usually comfortable chairs to sit in. Um, there's sometimes games up there, so it's a great place to hang out. Um, on a tour. And if you are a photographer, one big tip I have um, uh, is to bring, make sure you bring gloves because uh, you know your fingers are always out and you're working your camera. So make sure you bring gloves that you know that you can work your camera with um, because you're there in the winter. I mean, I guess for folks in California and us Oregon with our, with our, you know, more calm temperatures, 30 degrees is cold to us, but Midwesterners, it's nothing. <laughs> so you'll be fine. <laughs> oh, you know, that is a good point about gloves. What I have worn quite a bit, even around here when it's cold in the morning. On um, our screen. Yeah. Oh, try oh. again. You froze for just a okay. moment. <laughs> um, Land's End has these great silk glove liners that are really thin. I think they're around $20. And it's enough where you can still manipulate a camera and you can still get into your wallet and you're not all just kind of, you know, your fingers aren't bundled up to the point where you can't use them. So not endorsing yeah. a specific brand, but I have found those <laughs> to be um, very nice. Keep my hands warm. That's okay. I love the travel tips and I love your trip about bubble wrap. I didn't even think about that in the past. And that's in this tour, you visit some wineries as well. And so, and you can buy wine bags for your luggage too, where you can put your bottle of wine in a line ba wine bag and it seals shut. So in case there was an accident with your luggage and the wine bottle breaks, it stays contained within that bag. So, um, but, or you just, ask the winery to ship it back home <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but there are these little uh, travel packing um, tips that, that are really great. Those, those are wonderful on the yeah. bubble wrap too. And That's the really jump, actually the jumbo size Ziplocs, I think it's the two or three gallon size. I have used those to bring wine home without buying the special wine bag. And I'll grab the bubble wrap, stick it yeah. in one, a little more bubble wrap, or maybe dirty clothes, put it in the other one with the zip <laughs> going the opposite way. That's and, great. Uh, I have not had a breakage problem yet, she said, knocking wood. <laughs> not yet, knock on wood. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. So we'll just go ahead and continue for and kind of put a close on to this program. Just a couple reminders that we are online at Fort Oregon State. Dot org have it right on this slide dot org slash travel you can find our travel talk schedule there too we've got three talks coming up like i said before and they're the more of a, a the education style of talk about geography and and sustainability and and fish and and those are going to be really great programs in may and in june so check those out and then all of our tours are online. We have a slew of 2025 tours up. So don't just think beyond 2024. There's a ton of 2025 options. Reach out to us if you have any questions about any of these trips. And then of course, 
we're on Facebook, just like everybody. So you can always find us there. Um, and thank you, Julie, very much for joining us tonight and telling us about this tour. And thank you all for listening. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.